three books, Pi and the English Alphabet, Volumes 1 and 2, and The Peacock's Tales. His third book in the series, Pi and the English Alphabet, is slated for release in early 2015. He has an ongoing YouTube lecture series and an online radio show discussing everything from myth, math, spirituality, philosophy, sacred geometry, lost civilizations, and the holy sciences. A scholar, a gentleman, and an all-around badass, Marty, my man, welcome to THC. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> Yeah, man, this is this is great. Thanks for being here. I watched about 10 hours of you teaching about the mathematical code embedded in our alphabet, the Bible, and a whole host of other areas, and it's impressive, man, but it seems so hard to talk about. I mean, how do you usually break people into this topic? Yeah, that's that's a difficult thing that I have um, when I do these podcasts is explaining this stuff on the air because we are dealing with a lot of it is dealing with symbolism. A lot of it's dealing with geometry and mathematics. And a lot of times when you have these conversations, you can get lost. So um, gematria is the art of assigning numbers to letters. Um, and so basically what my the work that I'm, I'm engaged in is focused on is looking at this phenomenon through the English language. So mm -hmm. um, basically the idea is that when the modern, the 26 letters of the modern English alphabet was formed, it was formed using a mathematical structure, what's known as a cryptogram or a cipher. And um, and, and we can, we'll go into this, but we sure. can explain how the numbers to the letters, how this, this whole thing works. Now, the we need a little history here before we can go into that because gematria has been known for a very long time. Some of the major languages, especially that the Bible has been written into, um, two of the main ones being Greek and Hebrew absolutely had ciphers for the languages, meaning that the construction, the syntax, the orthography, how languages are put together, how words are formed, um, and, and things that are behind names and concepts and ideas, there's there's mathematics behind there. And so we know for a fact that Greek and Hebrew had this. So mm -hmm. all I'm basically all I'm doing is my thesis is is saying that yes, there is absolutely one that was created for the English language and that we can we can start to understand this and we can understand it through the symbols and ideas and things that we find in um, well, like the Freeman Masonic square and compasses, for, for instance, the Jewish menorah, the tetragrammaton, things like this, and we'll and we'll go into some of this. But th that's basically what um, the focus of my study is. But this brings in all so many different aspects of our reality into one holistic study, though, because it's done through our language. So we could look at symbols. We can look at astrology. We can look at astronomy. We can look at, um, the, like I said, secret societies. We can look at names and concepts in the Bible. We can look at games such as chess and dice and billiards and backgammon. And we can look at these and find out that every single one of these things has a mathematical foundation. Um, and so this is that's basically what gematria is in a nutshell. And as your intro said, I have a whole lecture series where I go and look at particular things like I like I said billiards I do a whole video on billiards chess I do one on chess I do uh, a video on the name of Jesus Christ breaking down the mathematics of it and like I said there's probably I mean I think there's like 50 or 60 videos on there and I've got <laughs> yeah. a bunch more I'm working on so <clears throat> yeah and then no, no problem. And it, it's that's a pretty good introduction, and it seems super fun. I mean, I've heard you say, and this was kind of interesting, that most people think of numbers as just quantities. You know, I've got three books, or two apples, or I performed six ritual sacrifices. But <laughs> numbers, uh, they can also be a quality. Can you explain that distinction? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, and this is this is a very, very important thing to understand when we look at mathematics. And this is something that basically within the modern understanding of mathematics that, that's being taught in our, you know, the universities and things like that, I would say is kind of basically wholly dismissed is that numbers have qualities to them. They and, and every single number does. So when you look at a number like two, you're not just looking at two apples or two oranges or, you know, uh, you know, et cetera, like that. You're actually looking at what, what does the number two mean? Well, we can go out into the universe and see that the number two has a quality to it. And when you look at the number two, it has a black and a white, a yin and a yang, uh, an up and a down, that sort of thing. This is what's known in philosophy as the reconciliation of opposites or the coincidentia positorum. So we can look at a number like two and say there's a quality to it. We can also bring in a geom the geometry of this and see that it has a quality. So we're not just looking at the quantity. We're looking at, hey, what is, what is the number two in geometry? Well, it's just two points. Mm -hmm. That doesn't create any sort of plane or any space for movement. There's nothing spatial about it. Now let's go to the number three. Well, three is not just, once again, it's not just quantity, not just three oranges. You actually have one, two, three points that come together to create a triangle. And this is what you could call the embryonic polygon of creation. But it's the first uh, geometric form that you can create in two-dimensional space. So therefore, by the very nature of its geometry, it has a quality to it. 
It has, mm-hmm. you know, that, that sort of thing. This is what um, this is what numerology really, really is the study of. Um, now, when I say numerology, a lot of chances, uh, you know, chances are a lot of people are just going to be like, oh, he's a numerologist. You know, this guy's a kook, a crank, a charlatan mm-hmm. kind of thing, right? Because that's a lot of times that's what numerologists are. They're full of shit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but what numerology really is, is number logic. That's what numerology means. Ology means the study of or logic. And then numer means number. So basically, well, all numerology is, the entire study of numerology is understanding that there's number logic. So when we look, there's basically two forms or two, um, two sides of the study of mathematics. It's the quantitative and the qualitative. And it's only when we merge these two do we get the full understanding, a full comprehension of, of what this study is. And so that's, that's what's important. And really, the, the problem is, is that we've been taught mathematics from our federal education system. Right. Which is which is god fucking awful, you know. I mean, it really is. <laughs> yeah. And so and so when people approach mathematics, they pro uh, they see mathematics in this very cold, clinical, dry. You know, it's really co- convoluted and ugly. And the pro and really when I you know as I'm an autodidact, you know, I study all this stuff myself. I didn't graduate college or anything like that. I just you know pursued this study myself. And when I went into it, I realized that there's a harmony, there's beauty within this stuff. And um, and it's actually when it gets to, when you get down to brass taxes and the nitty gritty of it, it's really simple, and you can mm-hmm. understand these things and you can see them all around the world. So, yeah, man, I'm, I'm sure you get this all the time, but I've never liked math. Kind of like what you're getting. Every at, but, show I do, man. Every <laughs> right, single <right>. show. <laughs> and just like you, I kind of I dropped out of college, and there were a thousand factors, but math was a huge one. And I've done so much learning since then. It's it's kind of ironic, but. I was just done with it at the time, and as I've learned about sacred geometry and things like your work and playing with numbers and seeing them as more of an art, I've, I have started to look at it differently, and it's kind of funny because now I'm looking back at people that I know in my life who really were more math people, and I'm like, huh, I wonder if they just saw the art in it despite it never being shown, and that's just why they got it. You know, are you, Do you see that a lot more with people when you start to approach them with this side of the equation? You know, it's it's absolutely amazing how many people that have contacted me that have said, God, I hated math until you taught it to me, <laughs> you know, and I mean, that that's the whole that's my whole goal. I don't really even consider myself a writer or a researcher or, you know, or, or like, you know, anything like that or even a mathematician or a linguist in any sort of capacity. I really I feel like I'm a teacher. And so I'm trying to, and of course I've made my own discoveries and things like that, but really what I'm trying to do is take everything that I've learned from all of these other fantastic and wonderful researchers and present it in this very clear cut, very, you know, terse, straightforward way that people can understand it. And I think that if we actually had an education system that did this, people would not be scared of math because they would be able to look down at a flower and see it and be like, Mm. oh, okay, that's the degree of Philo Texas. Oh, that's the Fibonacci sequence. Oh, that's the the seal of Solomon in a, in the head of a flower, you know. <laughs> and you start to realize that what these, act, especially when you know mentioning the seal of Solomon, what a lot of these ancient sacred quote unquote sacred symbols are actually referring to. They're referring to universal architecture, mm-hmm. and this is what all of the ancient cultures understood. Any any like golden age civilization or any sort of advanced civilization understood that there was a there was a harmony, there's proportion, there's ratios, that there's a there's a construction of our universe and it's based on the canon of number. It's based on number and geometry. Mm-hmm. And um, these frequencies that we find within the number, this this canon of sacred number that we find within sacred geometry, we find it within music as well. You know, mm-hmm. and we find it within uh, time. We find it within space. You know, really what. Um, understanding numbers does is brings all of these things together and realize these are not separate things that we're studying here. It's not like we're going to study time and then we're going to study space and then we're going to study music and then we're going to study spatial relationships. No, we're going to bring it all together into one holistic study and we can do that through the foundation of number. Mm -hmm. And I think when you start to learn that stuff, as more synchronicities happen and more things connect, more dots connect, it just propels you to be more interested. And that's something that in 15 years of school just never happened. And I mean, on the subject of the school system, the thing for me is always, as a conspiracy-minded person, is this a purposeful thing or an unfortunate coincidence? But when I look at the school system, it's like... It's purposeful. Yeah, I mean, the the elite, they have tried to hide this stuff and put a lot of effort into making it that way. So it seems like purposely making math boring is so people will avoid this type of study for the rest of their lives. 
And that's exactly what we have. Yeah. That's exactly what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I mean, it, it, I even look at it in the context of my own life. I mean, how long did I steer away from mathematics, even though apparently I'm somewhat inclined to be, you know, <laughs> understand mathematics. And yet I never touched it for years because I was like, Gee, I mean, I got a C in college algebra, man. <laughs> and yet here I am writing books on pi. You know, right, that's, right. that's insane. You know, I mean, if, if, if there was, if college was meant to actually teach you these things and high school was meant to actually teach you these things so you could understand it and take it out into the world and see your world and understand your world, then you'd be able to, you, you should be able to get it right away. I went, you know, I went through how many, you know, mathematics courses and things like that and it never struck to me. You know, it was mm-hmm. only when I went on my own to learn this stuff that, um, it, I really got it. You know, um, it's like that. And I, I mean, I feel like, College, especially college, um, is, is, is pretty much a scam, you know, when it really right. comes down to it. You know, all of the things that you can learn in college, you can learn on your own. You know, you don't need to go to, uh, you know, spend $60,000 to read Plato's Republic. You can just go to the local bookstore and pick it up for a buck mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, it's, it's like that line in, um, in Goodwill Hunting where he says, you know, you spend $150,000 on an education you could have got for $1.50 at late fines at the public library, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, how true is that? Exactly. You know? I mean, people are enslaved, you know, in debt, enslaved by going to school to learn these things, and what are they doing? They're mm-hmm. basically regurgitating something that is taught to them as opposed to actually going out, learning this stuff, and making your own discoveries. Right. I mean, most there's actually a book called, what's it called? The Art of Scientific Investigation by W.B. Burbridge, I think is his name. I might be getting that wrong. Hmm. But basically, the whole book is about how all the major the discoveries of the world were discovered by people that had flashes, had revelations, that had were out on their own discovering something. It's not like they were stuck in a classroom and all of a sudden the light came on. Mm-hmm. No, they were out learning this stuff themselves. And this is where true discoveries are made. People that are People that are going against the grain, going against the status quo, going out on their own, going into the peripheries of thought and make and pull something out and bringing it back to humanity and saying look this makes sense this can be verified yeah. you know yeah. um, and we actually have a lot of researchers in our own time maybe thanks to the internet maybe thanks to cosmic cycles maybe thanks to how many people are on this planet whatever it is that are doing that right now and that's what's uh, so beautiful about our time yeah man i totally agree with you i think some of the most fascinating thinkers never really did that well in school and it just makes so much sense that they wouldn't but on, yeah on, didn't albert einstein flunk out yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jacques Fresco is another guy, like he's a futurist. Uh, he heads the Venus Project. But yeah, he was done with school at like age age 15. And he was just reading books in the library instead of going to class. I think it was even younger than that. Mm-hmm. It's just funny. And the, the college thing, the tuition aspect is a funny angle because if any one of us had just 20 grand up front to start a business or start something, we could probably do amazingly well. But you're not even really allowed to do that. It isn't a choice because they'll only give you the money for school. Yeah. There's no, there's no other thing that a person who's 18 with no credit or no assets can acquire a $20,000 loan. It's the only reason. And uh, it's sad. You know, it just is. I, I was, I mean, when I graduated high school, um, I mean, I was scared to the bone about what I was going to do with my life. And there was just an enormous amount of pressure to say, well, you better go to college. What are you going to are you going to get out and just, you know, change oil mm-hmm. for a living as if there's anything wrong with being <laughs> someone who changes your oil? There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I mean, it, it, that was the whole pressure. It was like, what, are you going to be a loser the rest of your life? You better go to college and get that degree. Otherwise, you know, and um, and I fell, uh, you know, I, I fell victim to that. I did go to college for about a year, year and a half, and and I remember when I was in college, I was a very curious person um, and and things, and I ended up reading a lot of my own, more so than I, I mean, I read more books on my own than I did in my college classes. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember reading Carl Sagan at that point, I was reading Edward Abbey at that point and things like that, and I remember, I was like, what the, what the fuck am I doing here? (laughs) I'm reading more on my own in my, in my college dorm then I was learning anything in college, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm, and, and I need to, you know, a disclaimer here, whatever. It's not like I'm saying if you go to college, you're an idiot or something like that. You know, I'm just saying that the things that you can learn there can be learned on your own, you know, yeah, and um, unfortunately, we just we live in this time where it's like, well, you need that college degree to get a job. But now we even know that that's kind of bullshit. <laughs> I know how many people that have graduated college that are not doing anything in the in their you know mm-hmm. um, that they studied for you yeah know? they have the same job they've been having part-time all through college but uh, let's dive into your work a little bit man I know it can get confusing especially without a visual aid but 
uh, to decode something, you need a cipher. And you've uncovered a cipher for the English alphabet that reveals a lot of the sacred knowledge and some of the major traditions uh, that we have in our culture. And it's going to be important for the audience to have a clear picture of the cipher so they'll understand the connections, right? I mean, I know you, you do this all the time. I guess uh, lay that out for the people. Okay. Um, yeah, to a uh, little, little ca- forward here, caveat before we start. Um, anything that I'm talking about here, um, I don't want you to believe me. I, I ask you not to believe me. Question everything I'm saying. Don't trust me. And then I what, what I want you to do is go out and investigate this stuff yourself because that's the most important thing. Because if I am relaying any sort of quote unquote truth to you whatsoever, you should not have to believe me. It's something that you can verify for yourself. That's what science is. So that's the first thing I want to say. So anything I'm going to go over here, please double check this stuff. <laughs> and what I've done is provide for, for absolutely free. Um, all the all the ways that you can go and understand this cipher and all the ways that you can use it. So, like I said, I've got a bunch of lectures for free. Um, I have a I have a blog at world-mysteries.com. Um, you can check all this stuff out absolutely free. So perfect. So, <clears throat> what it is is we have 26 letters of the English alphabet, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody knows it: A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y A N Z. These 26 letters, we can see what we can do is actually split them in half, split them in two chunks of letters. And we can go, and this would be a block of 13 and 13. And notice we're splitting in 13 and 13, and 13 has always been this unlucky number, right? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, there's, there's a, a psychological thing called uh, triskaidectophobia, where you don't even, you know, they won't even put a 13th floor in a building. <laughs> Actually, in my apartment complex here, um, it goes from 12 to 14. I'm in, I'm in apartment 14. <laughs> wow. There's no 13, yeah. So with this, there's this aversion throughout history to this number 13. Why? Well, you know, because of, there's, let's just say it, conspiracy, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a reason for that, you know. So we're splitting the alphabet 26 letters into 13 letters and 13 letters, A through M and N through Z. Why are we doing this? What's the reason for this? Well, once again, as we kind of you know, briefly touched on before, is this idea of the coincidentia appositorum. It's this, this fundamental um, philosophical idea that permeates our entire reality. When you go out into your, the three-dimensional space and four dimension, you know, the fourth dimension of time, when we go out, we see this, this opposites, unity of opposites everywhere. This is what the yin-yang symbol is expressing. This is what the Mayan hunub ku is expressing. This is ancient symbol of black swirling with white. This is left and right, opposites, up and down, opposites, mm-hmm. forward, reverse, opposites. You know what I mean? This is your left hand and your right hand. Just look at your human body. You can split it right down the middle and you have a left side mirroring the right side. So this is why we're taking the, the 26 letters of the English alphabet and splitting it in 13, a block of 13 and 13. Just because all we're doing is looking at nature and seeing how nature works and saying, well, if, if you know, uh, language is natural in any sort of, you know, uh, in any sort of way, then obviously it's going to mirror nature. Mm-hmm. So A through M, N through Z. Now, basically what I did is I walked up the, the six days of creation and rested on the seventh putting numbers to the letters as we walk up. So we're going to take A through M, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So we're going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G being one, two, three, four, five, six, and we're going to rest on G and that's the seven. Mm -hmm. Now this, this comes from the Genesis, right? Right. This is the six days of God doing work and resting on the seventh, right? Well, what this is actually referring to is the three dimensional mathematics of every single uh, point of consciousness on, in creation. It's the 300, you know, it's, it's once again, four reverse, up, down, left, and right. Uh-huh. That's six directions of space resting on a central point. And that point is you. That's the point of consciousness of the human being. Boom. So this is what Genesis is actually referring to. Notice Genesis is, is a derivation of the word genetics. Yeah. This is where we get genealogy, generation, um, you know. Uh, well, what do you think a genius is? Right. <laughs> Someone who understands, you know, etc. So... We have this motif. This is a motif that, once again, permeates our entire reality, the uni- unification of opposites. So six days of God doing work resting on the seventh. We're just going to take this idea laid on the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, instead of going eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, et cetera, we're going to just walk back down. So we're going to climb up the hill, the holy mountain, if you will, and then we're going to walk back down. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. H, I, J, K, L, M is six, five, four, three, two, one. Mm-hmm. So that establishes the numbers to the letters of the first half of our alphabet. We're going to stop there a second and we're just going to uh, pause and say, okay, notice when we walked up, we went A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We stopped on the G. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the first, this is the seven notes of the major scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Right. 
Um, also, if you notice, that's the Freemasonic square and compasses. Yeah. There's a there's a compass pointing up and a square pointing down, and there's a G in the center there. Well, what one of the things that that the compass is referring to? One of the myriad things that this compass, this compass and square, this insignia is referring to is the study and art of gematria, and that's why that G is in there. Now, the compass is creates a circle, and the square, of course, creates a square, right? right. Pretty simple geometry. Mm-hmm. Well, in sacred geometrical study, heaven is known as a circle, as a three, and earth is known as a four, as a square. So you have this concept of th- the merging of three and four. Well, what is three plus four? It's seven, and G is the seventh letter of the English alphabet. Mm-hmm. So you have the Freemasonic square and compasses telling you about the concepts of heaven and earth, and also the concepts of three and four merging together to become seven, and this is referring to gematria. So this is one of the things, and like I said, one of the myriad things that the compass and square is is trying to purvey to humanity. And I actually have an, an entire video, it's like a 30-minute video, showing all the things that you can get from this. And it's just insane. <laughs> so that's why we're stopping on that G. Three dimensions of, you know, the six dimensions of space resting on the seventh and et cetera. So then we have, so basically that establishes our first block of letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Well, notice we created symmetry. We created this balance or this mirroring with these 13 blocks of letters, right? Right. A through M, N through Z. All we're going to do is because of economy, because of simplicity, because of elegance, because of beauty, we're just going to take those numbers and throw them onto the other side of the alphabet. So N, P, Q, or S, T is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then UV, W, X, Y, Z is six, five, four, three, two, one. Mm-hmm. And what this does is establishes the, the numbers to the letter, the, the correlation, numbers to letter correlation to the English alphabet. So, and so this is really easy to write out. If, you know, if you're, if you're at home, you can just write this out, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A, J, K, L, M, and then right below it, go N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, and then just write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And you have the cipher, the cryptogram for the English alphabet that is being uh, decoded um, or encoded, concealed within the, the emblem of the Freemasonic Square and Compasses. <laughs> so now what you can do is find pi within this. You can find pi actually twice within this cipher. What is pi? Pi is the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. So um, this is a, it's a mathematical constant, and it's really kind of been this, it's a mystery, man. It's very, it's a, there's like an, um, something very elusive about pi, right. because pi is this infinite number, right? It's an infinite, transcendental, irrational number. And when you say irrational, it just means that there's no ratio that we, we have, mm-hmm. no two whole number, you know, two whole numbers that we can divide to find this particular string of digits. This number just goes on and on and on. It's 3.14159265358979. You know, this thing just goes on. There's been 10 trillion digits of pi that have been calculated thus far. And yet we can't see the tail end of this thing. So it's really this, this, this central focus, this mystery within our creation that's embedded within um, mathematics that really kind of helps us question, gives us some clues into what's going on in our, in our world. So pi is, uh, pi is a central focus. So Pi um, is abbreviated 3.142. This is a very common abbreviation. And what's important to understand is that pi must be abbreviated at some point. It doesn't matter if you're doing algebra or, you know, uh, engineering or architecture, any of that stuff. You have to abbreviate pi because of its infinite nature. So 3.142. So now we can go back to our cipher and, and pull out the, the, the non-prime numbers. So a prime number is a number divisible by one in itself. So the prime numbers would be 2, 3, uh, five, seven, five, three, two. Well, the non-prime numbers would be one, four, six, and six, four, one. So we're going to pull out the non-prime numbers. One, four, six, six, four, one. One plus four plus six plus six plus four plus one equals twenty-two. And twenty-two. Notice there's only the there's the number seven that the whole thing is balanced on. It's the center, the G and T. Twenty-two divided by seven is three point one four two. It's an approximation of pi. <laughs> So, and what's really interesting is when we, when we, we, once again, we looked at the Freemasonic square and compasses to help us decode this. We looked at a symbol to help us decode this. The, 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 the quote unquote Jewish menorah is, is, is symbolizing this very thing. Right. Because you can actually literally lay the Jewish menorah on the, on the non-prime numbers. And then the central pillar will lead to the seven. And I've got several videos on this that you can double check this all yourself and you can do it yourself. And one thing I wanted to throw out real quick was uh, yeah, when yeah. people are visualizing, one thing that I thought was great that I saw in one of your videos, if you look at a Ouija board, 
the letters on the Ouija board, the alphabet on the board is separated A through M and then right underneath it N through Z in an arc-like pattern. And the top of the arc, the very highest point, is the center, the G and the T. And uh, that's kind of interesting. And then if you can imagine taking a menorah and laying it on them on on the alphabet on the Ouija board pattern these are the nodes where the candles would sit these are the numbers that add up to pi I mean this is pretty interesting stuff man yeah actually it's, it's funny you bring up the Ouija board because uh, um, <clears throat> this third volume that's because I basically I, I explain the cipher I have you know three books and I explain the cipher in different ways in each one of the books so one I use the Freemasonic squaring compasses and the tetragrammaton another one is dice you know etc and um, the next one is going to be the Ouija board to explain exactly what you just said. Oh, that's awesome. So, um, so when you look at the Ouija board, one of the thing you know, it's like, okay, what is the Ouija board? Well, it's where it's used to contact spirits of the dead, and you know, you know, you're going to talk to your grandmother in another dimension or something. Well, no, really, what it's there to do when you when you strip away all the you know the bullshit, if you will, is pass on deep occult truths about the nature of our language. So yeah. So um, so basically, once again, we we established pi on two sides of our alphabet, A through M and N through Z. So pi begotten by seven, if you will, 3.142, pi begotten by seven, 3.142. Well, when you bring these two pi's together, one of the symbolic representations of the tetragrammaton, which is the holy name of God, it's known as Jehovah or Yahweh, is, is known as pi seven, pi seven. And this is exactly what we find in our alphabet. So uh, bringing the two pi's together, you get this you know, symbolic representation of God, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, why this is important, it's called the tetragrammaton. Gramma means message, and it's where we get the word grammar. <laughs> so it's like, okay, here's this representation of God, you know, that's supposedly told to us in a book, and then it's like, okay, well, where do we find this thing? Well, obviously, it's telling us it has something to do with language, you know? Mm -hmm. This also, this uh, and we can't get into this right now, but this is also one of the things they're talking about when they say in the beginning was, or, um, you know, a God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God we're talking about a word. We're talking about language. So we can't really get into that right mm -hmm. now. But one of the other things that is important about the tetragrammaton is the tetragrammaton in Hebrew gematria um, was uh, he vav he yad. And this was the numbers five, six, five, 10. Well, this equals 26 and there's 26 letters of the English alphabet. Wow. So, but even more now we're going to take our cipher that we just deconstructed and we're going to go to the names of God that we have in the Holy Bible. And this is, there's two names of God and there's, you know, they're combined to become Lord God. So there's Lord and God. Lord in the cipher is L-O-R-D is 2254. This equals 13. And God in the cipher, 724. G-O-D is 724. This equals 13. <laughs> so we have 13 and 13 and we bring it together and what do we get? 26. So the tetragrammaton in Hebrew gematria equals 26. There's 26 letters of the English alphabet. And we look at the name of Lord God using the cipher that I got from the Holy Bible, and it equals 26. Man, it fits pretty well. <laughs> it does. And you say, okay, well, it's just a coincidence. You're just playing with math. But no, I'm not playing with math because what you're doing is having, there's an exactitude and precision. And anybody that uses this cipher will get the exact same results 100% of the time, 100% of the time. So the problem with anybody that wants to make some sort of criticism against this is that all you're doing is if, if that's if you're going to criticize this or try to tear this down, all you're doing is criticizing empiricism. All you're doing is is criticizing the scientific method mm -hmm. because that's what I'm using is mathematics. Well, how do you think modern science interprets the world and deconstructs the world? They use math, man. <laughs> so you're going to get the same results every single time. Mm -hmm. And so this is so that's just this you know that's the cipher in a nutshell if you will. Now another important thing is once again we rested on 7. God rested on 7. Now 7 is an extremely important number, right? I mean everybody knows even if you've never studied comparative mythology or done inter interdisciplinary studies or you know know anything about mathematics, you've obviously known that 7 is a very important number throughout myth and, and spirituality and things like that. 7 days of creation, 7 chakras, 7 deadly sins, 7 notes of the major scale, 7 stars of the Pleiades, <laughs> you know, 7 the D big dipper, you know, days a week, 7 days a week, 7 tablets of the enuma leash, 7, you know, etc etc etc. You could just go on and yeah. on and on about the number 7. 7 in the cipher S E V E N is six five 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 one. This equals twenty two. Twenty two divided by seven is pi. <laughs> so the number seven in and of itself encodes pi. Period. End of story. Fact. You can double check it yourself. And then as you say, okay, so now we have 
tetragrammaton, Lord God, the number of English, you know, letters in the English alphabet all coinciding in this, this harmonious, beautiful way. And then you look at the number seven and it encodes pi as well. And you say, okay, how is this even possible? You know, right. and yet it is. It is. Yeah, man, it, it's real trippy. And I've heard you summarize this work by saying language and numbers have a fundamental relationship that speaks to the interconnectedness of all things. And that sounds really great. But the there's a, there's a slight disconnect for me. I mean, it, it seems to all fit. But when I'm trying to figure out why, I think about geometric principles are natural. Numbers and quantities exist in nature. But language is like a man-made invention. And unless you count Klingon and Dothraki, English is a fairly modern language. So they must have just put incredible detail into forming it, I guess, to make it all fit, right? You know, this really gets to the question of how, when when man creates something, when you and I create something as, you know, I mean, obviously as an artist or whatever, if I write a song or whatever, where, where does that come from? Right. The muse, maybe. Yeah. Where, where does it come from? Now, obviously, you know, I like I say, artists are secretaries for angelic revelation, if you will, that <laughs> we are we dictate things that come from the other, the ether, the invisible landscape, the astral plane, the, the nation of images that is your imagination. You know, you're bringing these things down and bringing them into the material world and interpreting them. But so much, I mean, I, it, when you, especially when you talk to a lot of artists, I've heard, I mean, I feel this way. I've heard, I don't know how many musicians talk about this. I've heard stand-up comics talk about this, mm -hmm. that when they're in that mode of creation, they're just, they're a conduit for it that they're bringing it out, that they're just opening themselves up so they can bring it out. I mean, I've heard Chris Cornell talk about this. I've heard Adam Durrett say this. Uh, you know, I've heard Tom Waits talk about this. I've heard, uh, a, a, like I said, a bunch of co comedians talk about this. In fact, um, in jazz music, this is called Real Gone. It's where you're so in the moment that you're just bringing these things out. Well, in my, in, in my opinion, when these people that were creating the languages at the time were basically aligning themselves, if you will, with these fundamental principles in creation and, in creation and allowing this stuff to just flow out of them, mm -hmm. you know, with this deep understanding of the nature of reality, you know, and this is why it became sacred. This is why all of these ideas became sacred hmm. um, because they were realizing that. And this is really what you're talking about is the way you're talking about the Tao. You talk about the ever flowing way of creation. Mm -hmm. Well, an artist or somebody who's is in tune, a shaman, a, you know, a, a psychonaut or whatever, anybody that's in tune with that is getting aboard, you know, is getting is jumping into the river and let and flowing with it, mm -hmm. you know, and allowing that river to take them, you know, where they need to go. And this is where the creative impulse I feel comes from, you know. So this is where we have to really step back and say. Okay, yeah, well, th this is impossible because man created language, or no, language has just evolved. Well, really, we don't know. I have no idea. You don't know. Nobody that's listening really, truly knows. And we can't go back in history to say, yes, this is exactly what happened. But what we can do is take a look at it now and deconstruct it and say, yes, there was intention there and that there are definitely sacred principles embedded within it. Now, why this is important is pi is a constant in mathematics. And pi is encoded within our alphabet. So the people that were trying to pass on this information to us absolutely understood pi and absolutely understood the nature of the importance of pi. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's also important is man didn't make math. We didn't create numbers. We didn't create mathematics. We didn't create geometry. All we're doing is is is, is interpreting it from the great creator, the grand architect, nature, the cosmos, the universe, whatever the fuck it is you want to call this thing. Mm -hmm. We're interpreting it and bringing it into our world to help us understand our relationship with it. Yeah, well said, man. And I wanted to double back to the uh, square and compass for a minute because you know, I'm watching all these videos, I'm listening to all these presentations, and I tried to mess with some of these numbers myself, and I was thinking about the square and compass. And if the circle is 3 and the square is 4, that makes 34, and they're supposed to be 33 degrees of masonry, you know, the 32 and then the honorary 33. I wonder if there's a secret degree of masonry that nobody talks about above 33 because the numbers do equal 34. Uh, man, there's uh, there's so many different places we could go here because we could look at 34, we could look at 43. It's just a curiosity. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, when you look at the 33 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonic Ascension, right? Number 33 is steeped in esoterica and occult, right? I mean, uh, once again, this is just something that even if you haven't really studied these things, chances are you came across the number 33, you know? Right. Um, when you look at 3 plus 4 is 7, 
right? Well, there's seven chakras in your endocrine system. Now, if you don't believe in the chakra system or whatever, well, you really don't have to. But you do know that there are there are places where the nerve currents come together and there are seven points of these. And that's just straight anatomy, you know? So you have the seven chakras that are uh, on your spine, right? Well, there are 33 bones in your spinal column. Mm. So you have the number, you know, the heaven and earth coming together and you and referring to the number 33. And once again, you see, you know, it's a, right. It's attached to the number seven. It's attached to the Freemasonic square. Coming, you know, the whole thing. It really allows you to pull all this together. The other thing about 33 is that 33 is actually 34. Well, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, you forgot one thing. You forgot the zero giving uh. you 34 digits. So zero, one, two, three, five, six, seven, et cetera, to 33, giving you 34 digits. A lot of times when we do mathematics, we forget about the first number or non-number is, in, is basically refers to the immateriality of the other side, if you will. You Good know? point. So, um, and another important thing about this is that every single mathematical system that you use in, in, incorporates the zero. You know, like, for instance, we're on the Internet right now, and the Internet is a binary system, but it's not a system of one and two. It's a system of... Zero and one. Yeah. So that's so that's just w- one way to understand that. <laughs> um, if you don't mind, I w- let's let's talk a little bit about this idea of the concepts of heaven and earth. Sure. What the hell that even means, yeah. and why is it referred to a compass and square? When you when I say heaven, most people refer to heaven as in that we are understood through the literalist or fundamentalist. What a lot of times it's called fundamentalist version of uh, the, the Bible, right? Mm. The people read this document as um, a historical textbook, if you will. Well, it's not. There's, there's nothing real about the thing. It's a story of myth. It's a story. It's a it's a symbolic stories, and you're not supposed to take any of this literally. The first verse of of the Bible is Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heaven, and the earth. Well, it, by by relating these things, what they're doing is trying to teach you about geometry. So the, by relating these things to geometry, what we can start to understand is the, the nature of our own minds and the limitations of our own minds and how we can um, really understand the archetypal um, way that we think, the symbolic way that we think and how we interact with our world. Heaven is known as a circle, as a three, and earth is known as a four, as a square. Okay, let's break this down. The circle encapsulates the most amount of space, right? Mm-hmm. So if you take you take a length of string and you make it a square or a poly, you know, any sort of polygon, a square, a rectangle, a triangle, if you make it a circle, that circle will encapsulate the most amount of space, the most amount of area, period. That's just the way it works. So really what you have there with the inherent or, or innate symbolism of the circle is you have the all or the entirety of the wholeness that is, in, that is you know, encapsulating. Now, what's important about the circle is that we can never truly find its area. Right. Why? Because we have to use pi. We have to use pi. And pi, at one point, we have to approximate, as we were talking about before. So we can never, ever truly find the area of a circle. Why this is important is, why is it related to heaven? Because we can never truly measure the heavens. Yeah, it's the infinite. It's the infinite, right? And that makes sense. That makes sense that it would be attributed to a circle because, you know, like I said, pi is this infinite number. We can't see its tail. We look out into the heavens. We, I mean, how far does this shit go? We don't know. You know, where's the edge of the universe? I don't know. You know, but now look at a square. A square is Earth. Well, we can measure the Earth. We can measure the Earth. We can take a length of tape and measure this thing, True. right? So, and now when we look at the square, the square, we can always find the area of a square. Always. Because all we have to do is square something. So if the length of a side of a square is two, well, two times two or two squared is four. So therefore, we know the area of a square. So this is why heaven is known as a circle and the infinite and um, earth is known as a square. And so this is why the and once again, this is not this is not me just you know placing these ideas on this. This is something inherent in the geometry. Now, this motif of this of heaven being a circle and earth being a square is is all over. It's in Buddhism. It's in uh, when they build this thing, it's called the. It's the semi-hemispherical structure called the Buddha stupa, and they use this motif of heaven being a circle and earth as a square. Yeah. In alchemy, you have the same thing. Um, that one of my favorite alchemical illustrations is the one I reference all the time. It's called um, Rebus, um, and it's by yeah, I'm forgetting his name right now. Sorry, but uh, you can look this up, and it's basically this this man, uh, well, this human being that's got a head of a woman and a man, and he's carrying he she the hermaphrodite is carrying a square and compasses, and it's standing on a, a a circle, and in that circle is the numbers three and four. 
And so we see it in alchemy. We see it in Buddhism. We see it in the in the well um, Judeo Christian canon with you know Genesis one one and beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We also see it in the Freemasonic square and compasses. So this is an idea that's that's prevalent all over, you know. Yeah. And so all we have to do is actually go to the, the the mathematical language of creation to understand what it is they're referring to. Yeah, man, it it just blows my mind. And I I think uh, you also showed in the video, I believe the. Symbols for the seventh letters in and out of the Egyptian hieroglyphic alphabet also sort of symbolize pi too, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Where the G and T in the in the Egyptian language, yeah, are actually the 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 180 semicircle, and then the other one I think is that oh, I'm not sure which one it is. I think it's God, I'm, it's escaping me now. But the other one's like a delta and something else, which refers to 180 degrees as well. Exactly. Um, and so you have basically 180 degrees on the G and then 180 degrees on the T. And I think the T is the one where, no, the G is the one where it's a vessel or a cup. And then there's the, the triangle that's put in there, yes. you know, and of course, esoterically and symbolically, if, you know, you know, spiritually, this is referring to the vessel that is you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're the vessel, the vessel is and then you're care, you're capturing the Holy Trinity within. And so, and then now, so you take the G and T on both sides, if you will, of the Egyptian alphabet and you put it together. Well, what do you have? You have the 360 degrees of a circle yeah. and that is split within 180, 180. Well, what is that? Well, that's the geometry of pi. That's what it, that's what it would be referring to. So you have this same idea within the Egyptian hieroglyphs as well. Yeah, that's so weird to me that you can take totally separate languages, lay out their alphabets, uh, mirror one side to the other, look at the symbols in the middle, which would be another halving of it. And they they reference pi. It's like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, and the the idea that we, they're they're only seemingly separate. Yeah, know? exactly. And, and if, if you understand that there's an interconnectivity of number that is that that you know lays the foundation of our creation that underpins everything that we do, whether the words that are coming out of our mouth, how how you know uh, coastlines and and mountain ranges are formed, things like that, then you realize that no. There, you know, the Egyptians weren't some alien species that were living, you know, a few thousand years ago. No, they were just like us. And they were using, the, they, whether we are cognizant of it or not, are using the same principles of geometry and number that are embedded in creation. And so it allows us to see that, no, we're not separate, even though the languages might sound different, even though, the, you know, word constructions are different and things like that. But it still allows us to bring all these different things together, un understanding that beneath it is the numbers. Yeah, I mean, it would be really interesting to find out if some linguists or people who know like 10, 12 languages, I wonder if they subconsciously tap into the recognition of these patterns to make it easier. You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I know the problem with modern day, you know, philology and, and, and linguists and things like that is that there, there, there isn't any sort of cr um, cross study, you know, that there yeah. isn't the interdisciplinary study where it's like, you know, I'm a, la I'm a linguist. So that's what I study. I study languages. Well, if you, I mean, in order to truly understand language, if it is built off number, well, you better understand mathematics as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the same problem right now with um, a lot of people that are, are consider themselves scientists or whatever, you know, that, um, you know, guys like Lawrence Krauss and Neil deGrasse Tyson or Richard Dawkins and things like that. Well, Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist, right? Mm hmm. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a theoretical physicist or whatever, or Lawrence Krauss is a theoretical physicist. Well, that's that, you know, so if we're going to them for their explanation of the world, well, that's the explanation that we're going to get. We're going to get the explanation from a theoretical physicist. So they're going to look at the world as a theoretical physicist. They're not going to look at the world as, uh, you know, a, a sacred geometrician. They're not going to look at the world as a poet. They're not going to look at the world as a psychologist. They're not going to look at the world as a symbologist, you know, things like this. And I think a true holy science, the true science that is going to help us understand who we are and where we came from and what we're doing here and the nature of reality is bringing all facets together. That's what a true scientist is. And, and when you look at all of the, the, the ancient like polymaths of the world, guys like, you know, Da Vinci and Isaac Newton, they were into all sorts of shit, man. Yeah. It's not like they were just, oh, I'm a physicist, you know, so mm -hmm. I understand what's at the heart of an atom or something. No, man, they were looking at symbols. They were looking at, you know, poetry, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that this is what we really need to do if we're going to understand uh, um, our reality is bring all facets together. So, uh, if a, you know, this, the modern day there's sort of this like um, pulse that's going through the collective consciousness, right? Or the paradigm that exists right now. And that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one that's based on science, but it's not really based on science that, that you're actually incorrect there because a scientist is going to explore every single Avenue. A scientist is not just going to explore one slice of the pie or two slices of the pie or 14 slices of the pie. It's going to understand the 360 degrees of that thing. 
And that means you have to bring in every single facet of our reality together into one holistic science. Yeah, well said, man. And to take it back to schools, like we talked in the beginning, the nefarious design of schools, there are no subjects that are more divided than literary students and math. I mean, science and art, it's those are the two divisions. And uh, separating language and math, again, it seems like a very concerted effort is made to make sure that few people specialize in both. Well, it's not even taught whatsoever. I mean, you can buy books. This is what this is what you know what we talk about before. Going back to this, it's like you can buy. I have I have probably four or five books on my shelf that I'm looking at right now that exactly talk about the fact that there are mathematics behind languages. Mm -hmm. Go to any college and see if you can try to find that. You know, maybe <laughs> there are maybe they're out there, and maybe I'm just not you know I just don't know about them. But you know, I I certainly wasn't taught that. In fact, I just had a conversation. I just did um, the the Sync Book Summit this this past weekend. And uh, I took a few days off work and I came back to work and my bosses, they were, they were asking me, you know, cause they really don't know what it is I do, you know? So they were asking me, it's like, what, so what do you do? Is it numerology or what, you know? And so I started saying, well, there's, you know, there's mathematics to languages and things like that. And, and they were just kind of like dumbfounded. They were, there's just this straight blank look on their face because it's like, well, I was never taught that in college. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> and no shit you weren't, you know, does that mean it's not legit, a legitimate study? No. You know, right. <laughs> it's absolutely legitimate study. This thing is that you're not going to be taught these things. And this is where um, occultism and esoterica and things like that come in, because it's kind of the subversive studies that um, you're not going to be taught in any sort of, you know, uh, like I said, classroom or things like that. So, well, you mentioned the Sync Summit and my good friend Frater X was supposed to be up there. I don't think he made it, but uh... I know I was so bummed, man. <laughs> I got to meet him at the Free Your Mind conference. And yeah, we, you know, he's just a, he's a really great guy. And he is. I was, yeah, really looking forward to speaking to him again. But yeah, he just couldn't make it because of funds, you know. Mm -hmm. And so. one of my uh, questions for you was going to be what your thoughts on synchronicity, because I'm sure this kind of ties in to what you work with. Yeah, I mean, synchronicity is. You know, when people start to get into the study of synchronicity, I mean, mainly it was kind of brought forward by Carl Jung, you know, um, the Jungian study of, of psychology and philosophy and things like that. Mm -hmm. When you get into synchronicity, you realize that what one of the things that synchronicity allows you to understand is the world is not built as a machine. You know, it's not this nuts and bolts, cogs and gears kind of thing, you know, it that the, the, the world is 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 more, you know, for lack of a better term, magical and mystical. It's a story that's being played out. And when when you have synchronicities that happen, you can't the thing that is very important is you can't just step back and say, oh, it's all Illuminati, or New World Order or, you know, of some global cabal or control faction that's running everything that's in, you know, that has their hands in every single, you know, it's like. Mm -hmm. A good example is is what just happened with Robin Williams, right? right. Robin Williams, he, he hung himself in a door, right? And supposedly, whatever. Um, and then, of course, you had this Family Guy episode that was going to air that night or something like that or the night before or mm -hmm. whatever. And they ended up taking it down. And it's like, okay, well, Jesus, what are the chances, right? Well, how many people online automatically go to, well, it's the Illuminati. You know, it's the Council on Foreign Relations that's doing it all. They planned Robin Williams' death. I don't know, maybe. But, I mean, honestly, when you look at this, you have to understand that there's something much more going on. That you can't look at all of the synchronicities in the world and blame it on some New World Order or some Illuminati or the Skull and Bone Society or, you know, whatever it is, that there's something much more going on here. Now, the people that are in power, the quote unquote Illuminati, the what, whoever it is, you know, I, I think in my opinion, they understand that this is how the world works. And so they use that to their benefit. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they control everything. It's impossible to control any, everything. No one's in control. Control is C-O-N-T-R-O-L. This is 3217522. This equals 22. There's seven letters in control. 22 divided by seven is pi. What's in control? The universe is in control. The great, you know, the great creator is in control. Synchronicities allow you to understand that this is one way that the universe works. That it's like, like I said, it's not some cut and dry nuts and bolts kind of thing. That there's a magic to it, and um, this is why I think synchronicity is one is a, is a very important thing. I I love when you break down certain words and put them on the cipher because uh, another one that just drove me nuts was the word knowledge equals 33, which is 33 degrees of masonry, and they <laughs> hold knowledge. You know, it seems like they know what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like common sense equals 33. Um, I think virtue equals 33. Knowledge, you uh, abecedarian. Abbasidarian is a, is a person who understands, it's, it's a person who studies the alphabet. That's what an ABBA, AB is, of huh. course, alphabet. Abbasidarian equals 33. And you did a video on 
Hermes Trismegistus, and that had an interesting equation there. Let's do this. Hermes, Hermes equals 28. So H-E-R-M-E-S is, you know, 655, what is it? 655156, this equals 28, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Hermes was also known as Thoth, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Thoth is T-H-O-T-H, this is 76276. Um, And so that equals 28. So you have the same mythological character being Hermes and Thoth, both equaling 28, right? Well, Hermes is known as Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus. This is also the Roman god Mercury, right? Mm-hmm. So we're, we're talking about the planet Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. The orbital path of Mercury is 88 days, right? So it just whips around the sun super fast, 88 days. Well, 88 divided by 28, Thoth and Hermes equals pi. It's 3.142. <laughs> so now that's, oh, that's an absolutely arbitrary connection. You're just putting the number of paths of the, you know, the, the path of the Mercury and then putting it to 28. Okay. Okay. Now let's step back and say, look at your hands right now. Look at your hands. If you're out there, look at your hands and count. You have two sections or what they're called uh, segments or they're called phalanges on your thumb. So there's one, two, it allows you to get that 90 degree of your thumb to bend and grasp and grip the world, two sections on your thumb. And then you have three on each finger. So you have four fingers three in each, so that's a 12, and then you have two on your thumb being 14. So the segments of your hand equal 14, correct? So mm-hmm. 14, so you have two hands, well that would be 28. So the number 28 is, is on your hands, right? Yeah. A grand piano is 88 keys, right? The grand piano mm-hmm. is 88 keys. So when you put your two hands on the piano and you start playing, you know, whatever it is, Franz Liszt or, you know, <laughs> you know, happy birthday, whatever the fuck it is you play on the piano, 88 keys and 28 phalanges, 88 divided by 28 is pi. Well, that's why you're playing the pi anno. Uh, and that's, good, that's, man. that's the exact math. And it, you could, you could say, well, whatever, you know, but what about if there's 71 key or 61 keys and things like that? But no, the grand piano and why the grand piano has 88 keys is because this is basically the range that human beings hear at. It's, it's a seven and a third octaves, you know, mm-hmm. and you can even go to a piano and hit that low key. It's like, boo, 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 boo. and then the real one, tink, 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 tink. Anything beyond that, it's like you basically the human being can't essentially hear it, you know, so that's why there's 88 keys on the piano because it's, it's understanding that whoever created the piano, Understood that the understood the uh, the principles of number understood the resonances and harmonies that are built within creation and that they're built right on our hands. Yeah. So, God, so that's just one way of yeah. <laughs> so you know we talked about the mirroring of the alphabet and G is the seventh letter in and then if you go from the back uh, the seventh letter would be T and T is pretty important as well. You want to go into the the T a little bit. Yeah, so when we stopped in G, and that was the Freemasonic square and compasses, that was number seven, right? And so we saw that seven, the word itself encoded pi, equaled 22, and 22 divided by the word seven is 3.142. So now where we stopped on the other hand was T, as you were saying, Mm -hmm. and T is known in mathematics as tau. Well, where pi is the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, tau is known as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its radius, so half the diameter. And this is twice pi. So it's 6.2, uh, 6.28 instead of 3.14, if you will. So, so these are two uh, fundamentals in mathematics. Once again, these are, these are prominent uh, constants in mathematics, pi and tau. The tau cross in mysticism is, is I mean, it's all, it's all over, you know. Uh, and basically all it is, is is two lines coming together to create a T. Well, what are those two lines? Well, just stick your arms out and put your feet together and your whole body creates a cross, it creates a T. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is actually um, trying to unveil to us. The Vitruvian Man is the circle and a square. And in between that circle and the square is the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius. And he was sketched by Leonardo da Vinci just in his sketchbook. There's this really small thing that's, you know, it really captivated um, artists for a long time. Because like, well, what is what is he trying to refer to? Well, what he's doing is referring to the Tau cross, Tau in mathematics, the circle and square, heaven and earth, three and four. And the Tau is, is extremely important because really the Tau is um, – the, the, the Tau cross really – I'm going to get into mysticism a little bit here. But sure. really what the, the Tau is representing is the, um, the cross of matter, the cross of matter, that your body is the vessel. Once again, it's the, it's the, the car, the vehicle that the, the energy of the universe resides in and is, is descends into. 
Now we know that that um, that this material world will pass, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, our, our, you know, you're, you're born into this world and you're going to die. Somebody's going to watch you die. You're going to watch your body get put into the ground and you're going to, you know, eventually disintegrate. And then we say, well, what happens to that energy? Well, when it went by, by giving us pi and tau, we understand that pi is a representation of a fundamental representation of the creation of our universe with its infinite nature, its transcendental nature in the fact that we can't see the end, the tail end of it. It's representing infinity. But tau gives us the idea that, okay, that pi, if you will, the energy of the universe, goes into that material world. And so it's bringing both of these things together, and it's bringing them together through mathematics, once again. Something that we didn't create, you know, something that the universe created to give us to help us understand who we are. So Mm -hmm. I, I... it's it's i know that's i may not be hitting that directly you know i mean i may not be addressing what i'm trying to say directly but that's just one of the things that we can get with tau now tau is is very important in fact there's been a, a debate um about whether to use tau or pi when understanding mathematics like so for instance when you look at um, a sine wave sine and cosine and understanding um like the fundamentals of trigonometry mm-hmm. right well p- tau and pi are both used but tau is actually easier to use because when you measure the center of a circle to the edge you don't measure the diameter you you measure the radius the radius is always one mm-hmm. so you get that but the yeah. diameter in pi is one so but we never measure it that way we always, whenever we perform mathematics, we always start from the center and go out to the edge. And that's the radius. And so that's one. And so tau is an easier way to help us understand this. But they're both important, you know. And that's why they're both on the central G and T of our alphabet. Because it's trying, once again, these ancient people that understood this stuff implicitly or were trying to pass this information on to us. Yeah. And something else I was curious about, man, and, I, and you've touched on this in other talks uh, and other interviews, but when you think about the intelligent design of the universe, the Fibonacci sequence, phi ratio, and all these things, do you think that some of these truths that we extrapolate would come to folks more naturally if they spent more time in nature or with, with a certain kind of mindfulness? It seems like their level of exposure in the natural world is pretty perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, you know, when when people have asked me, like, okay, well, how did you, like, how did you figure this stuff out? How did you come about this information? What drew you to this? Well, um, I mean, number one, I've spent a lot of time reading all of these absolutely fantastic researchers, guys like John Michel, guys like Michael S. Schneider, Ari Schwalder de Lubitz, John Anthony West, you know, uh, watching guys like Scott Onstott and reading his books, Randall Carlson. You know, there's a bunch of researchers that I've spent and learned so much from them and I'm trying to purvey this information. But one of the other ways that I came to understand this was spending a whole shitload of time in nature. I mean, I, I'm like an avid hiker. I, I'm like pretty much every weekend I would go out and I'd go hiking, you know, spending a, just a ton of time in nature, basically just alone with my thoughts in this sort of contemplative, ment- you know, uh, you know, contemplative meditative state and like kind of just being within nature and, 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 and looking at it. You know, one of the mm-hmm. first um, let's go into something here. Sure. Actually, and to, to try to explain what I'm saying, <laughs> there's in, in, in numerology, one of the one of the base numerological principles is called decimal parity. It's called digital rooting. It's called Kabbalistic reduction. It's called Pythagorean addition. But it's this basic idea of understanding, once again, the qualitative, the essences of number. And what it is, is you take a sum of a number. So we're going to look at the number 134. Right. And all we're going to do is go one plus three plus four equals eight. Right. This is the crux of numerology, if you will. Now, what numerology allows you to understand is that there are basically 10 principles in the universe that create the universe, 10, 10 emanations of God, as it's called in the Sefer Yetzirah, 10 fundamental um, archetypes that, that, are, that are embedded in number that, help, that allow us to interact with nature and understand it. And these are, this is why you have 10 fingers. And this is the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, being 10 numbers. This is the base of numerology. Mm-hmm. When you go beyond 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you can break any of those numbers down to the digits 1 through 9. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We get to 10. 10 is 1 plus 0 is 1. 11, 1 plus 1 is 2. 12, 1 plus 2 is 3, etc. It doesn't matter how big or complex the number, you can always break it down to the numbers 1 through 9. And with adding the zero, giving you 10 digits. And once again, you see that was on your two hands. Now, I was in, I was hiking one time. And this is before um, I had written my first book, Pi the Great Work, which is no longer in print. Um, it's just a short run because it was just kind of a, 
anyway, um, yeah. I, I, before I was writing this book, I was exploring these ideas and I was in, I was hiking in nature and, um, I was, as, as Joe Rogan likes to say, high as giraffe pussy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I, and I was walking and I looked down and all of the, I live in Oregon and all of the trilliums were in bloom. Right. And mm-hmm. the trillium is this beautiful flower and it's got these three big leaves and then it's got th- and then there's a, there's like a central stalk in the middle and then there's three other leaves and then it's got the three petals or, or the, you know, the flower on top. And I and I was walking and I was just walking there all over and I just stop and I look down and I'm like, huh. I look at this thing and I'm like, OK, the central stalk is the zero. You have one, two, three. First level. Second level is four, five, six. Next level. The, the top level is seven, eight, nine. And this hmm. is how the trillium is built. And I'm not joking, man. I must have sat there for, you know, five, ten minutes just looking at this thing being like, huh. And it was then that it clicked that this was, um, this was, if you will, the fundamentals of numerology. And this is the fundamentals that help build our creation. And the, I, I understood this through a flower. You know, right. I, didn't, I didn't go to a classroom and said, hey, this is how this works, you know, and it was only when you go to the mathematics and you go to the number logic, the number logic of numerology, that it helps you understand that, yes, that's true, mm-hmm. because that's just how the math works. And so this is one of the things that when you're talking about going into nature and understanding these principles of nature, they're all over nature, man. This is what fractals is. This, you know, you can understand the Fibonacci sequence. You can understand the degree of phylotaxis. All you have to do is go out in nature and see it for yourself. You know. Yeah, man. And another example you gave that for some people they might think it's a stretch, but I thought it was really interesting is when you're talking about pi. So of course we have the sun, and the only time you can look at the sun without hurting your eyes is sunrise and sunset when the horizon halves the circle, and boom, it's got it's right there. You know, it may have taken a long time, but that seems like a brilliant way for the universe to reveal uh, tau to us or pi or that kind of mathematical equation. Yeah. So when you look at the um, yeah, when you look at the sun rising and setting on the horizon, the horizon creates the diameter to find the circumference of the sun, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, I would say that I mean I don't know because I didn't live back then, but I'm guessing that the ancient people that were you know inquisitive and looking into the universe or whatever eventually looked at that and were like, huh, that's interesting, right? I, I understand mm-hmm. that there's a line and a circle, and maybe I can triangulate that and then therefore understand how big the sun is, something like that, right? What's important, though, is that, yeah, that's the only time that you can actually look at the sun is when s- the sun, directly, is when the sun is creating pi in our sky, mm-hmm. you know? Now, um, horizon, H-O-R-I-Z-O-N. Horizon comes from the word Horus. This is where we get the word hours, Right. Right. When you uh, um, and you look at your watch to look at the hours, what are you doing? You're watching the sun. So Horus, horizon, the zone of Horus. This is where we get a horoscope. Horus, the ancient Egyptian sun god. Right. Um, horology is the study of the measurement of time. So <laughs> all of these things are coming from an ancient Egyptian god of Horus, Ra. Um, horizon in the English cipher, H O R I Z O N, is uh, 6255121. This equals 22. Horizon has seven letters. 22 divided by seven is pi. <laughs> Morning, M O R, uh, I'm not going to do all the numbers. You can check this yourself. Morning equals 22. 22 divided by seven is pi. <laughs> what happens when the sun rises on the horizon? It's morning. So both of those words that are referring to this astronomical event that we see every single day equals pi. What else is important? The sun actually creates pi in our sky because the sun rises on the horizon and sets. And, you know, set is, of course, the Egyptian sun god or the Egyptian, mm-hmm. um, the antithesis of Horus, set. So the sun rises and it creates a 180 degree arc over our sky. And then what happens? Well, that's day and then it becomes night. What does it do? Mythologically, it goes around us, if you will. Now, I understand the mechanics of that the earth revolves around the sun. Don't get me wrong. But you understand what I'm saying, that from our perspective, that's what we see. Well, that's creating pi every single day. It's cutting night and day into half, 180 degrees, 180 degrees. Yeah. So so that's yet another reference to pi that we see that just happens from our perspective every single day. Now, I I, want to say something here, too, that the, the sun revolves around the earth. Let me say that again. The sun revolves around the earth. Okay, this guy's batshit crazy. No, we know that the earth revolves around the sun, stupid, right? No, actually, it's both. Because from our perspective, the sun does revolve around us, mm-hmm. period, from our perspective. Now, the mechanics of the thing, if we took ourselves and we took – now, that's, that's our perspective from earth. 
But if we take the perspective from the heavens, we see that the earth revolves around the sun. So to truly understand our relationship to the creation, we have to take in account both perspectives, not just the one perspective. Yeah. You know, modern science is trying to take the human perspective out of it, right? Exactly. And this is ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. And, we, and we're starting on, and I don't like to get into quantum theory because there's so much quote unquote quantum quackery out there. Mm-hmm. But we understand this with the observer effect in quantum physics that the observer is absolutely instrumental in understanding you know, our relationship to the creation. So, therefore, understanding how we view the sun and how it revolves around us is, is just as important as understanding how we revolve around the sun, if you know what I'm saying. I. Oh, absolutely. And I that was an area I was planning to go to. But it is kind of funny that the universe has designed things to take our perspective into account. It is important. You know, uh, but then, like you said, science is trying to look at things totally objectively and filter that out. And it's like, well, it's you know, it's not designed to be looked at that way, as odd as that might sound. This is, once again, this is the coincidentia positorum. This is this ancient philosophical idea that really helps us understand. It's not just objective, it's subjective as well, mm-hmm. you know, and it's bringing both together. If you, re- if you ignore one, you're not going to get the full spectrum, you know. If you say, oh, it's just an objective understanding of the universe, it's, and it's the same thing with, um, you know, we could say um, spiritual and material, if you will, or celestial and terrestrial, if you will. You know, it's these ideas. If you just understand the earth and, and forget about the heavens, you're not going to get an understanding of the earth. If you're just a, a theoretical physicist and are constantly looking out into the heavens and not understanding your perspective on earth, you're not going to get a full, per, a full comprehension of what we're dealing with here. It is interesting. And looking at these clues in nature, I mean, when I look at that, I see another layer of manipulation from the puppet masters because in Western society, we're so far separated from nature and we're focused on these dead, dirty, concrete cities. And conveniently, it's another layer of separation from these fundamental truths. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think the ancient architects, the sacred geometricians of the past, the people that built Angkor Wat, the people that built, the, you know, the, the Mayan pyramids and the Egyptian pyramids, you know, uh, people that built Puma Punku, all of these things. They understood that when they built something, they were building artistry that reflected the uh, fundamental archetypes in creation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so therefore, we're at one. They were symbiotic with the creator, if you will. And they were bringing these things out to glorify and, and venerate. Um, these these fundamentals in creation. So, th- I mean, this is what um, this is what we can gather when we look all around the world and look at these ancient archaeological sites. That, w- with through the study of archaeoastronomy, understand that these things not only are embedding sacred geometric principles, not understand, in, uh, not only um, that, but you know, under um, embedding philosophical principles, uh, embedding um, astronomy, you know, of star star patterns and things like that. It it it's, it it just brings the whole thing together into one. You know, and this shows that these ancient people were much much more brilliant than we ever give them credit for you know and and i Mm -hmm. think that you know this is really where um you know terence mckenna was talking about the archaic revival right and there's been there's been people that have um i don't want to say his name but there's been people that have sort of been bashing the archaic revival as if we're like (laughs) oh that we're gonna go live in fucking caves again no man that's not what he's talking about that's not what he's talking about at all. What he's talking about is bringing back the ancient wisdom that is peppered all over the universe and all over the world. And all you have to do is go to these uh, these ancient sites and understand that there are sacred principles. There are things like phi and pi and, and, and Euler's formula and things like that that are embedded in things like the Great Pyramid of Giza. That cycles of time are embedded within Chichen Itza. And we can bring those back to help us re-understand and reintegrate our uh, the way we think and how we act and how we, you know, it allows us to put our best foot forward and bring back these sacred principles and embed these into our lives. You know, that's what an archaic rev- Revival is about. It's not about going to live in caves or you know dumbing ourselves down. It has nothing to do with that. It's actually elevating ourselves to understand that the ancient people that that lived on this planet that were wiped out by solar storms, tsunamis, pole shifts, you know, uh, ice ages, whatever it was, were very intelligent, and they were so intelligent that mm-hmm. they. This is the point that I like to make. When someone claims that our ancient people were intelligent, right? Oh, really? Were they? Okay. Well, if they were so intelligent. What, don't you think that they would be intelligent enough to to embed things in, for instance, our language to pass on to future generations? If they were so intelligent, they would probably know of the rise and fall and the ebb and flow and the high tides and low tides of the evolution of creation that they would know that things would get destroyed and that ma- mankind would have to pick himself up again and reintegrate and re-understand these things. And so they would have to leave these things to us in the future. Well, they did. 
and they left it in our language. They left it in ancient holy books like the Mahabharata and the Holy Bible and the, and the, the Talmud, and they left it in these archaeological sites in the Gothic cathedrals. The only problem is, is we have to go and actually understand what they were saying. So that is mm-hmm. what, uh, if you will, an archaic revival is all about. <laughs> well said, man. I really actually appreciate you saying that, especially in the context of my last show. But, um, man, Marty, it has been a real pleasure. This is one of my favorite shows. I love your rapid fire style. I mean, all my aut- autistic listeners are really going to love this one. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> for anyone else who needs like more time, I urge you, really, check out the YouTube presentations. They're really good. I love whiteboard videos, and you do a great job with them. Uh, before we go, do you want to give people some of your links again? Maybe a little info on what else you're working on? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, my books, once again, are uh, Pie in the English Alphabet Volume 1 and Volume 2, and I'm working on Volume 3 right now, and um, I'm hoping to have it out like early next year. Well, we'll see. And then I also have a book called The Peacock's Tales, The Alchemical Writings of Claudia Pabonis, and you can get that on martyleads33.com. And that's all available there. And um, I also have some DVDs and a Gematria calculator you can get for your phone and stuff like that if you want. Um, I have a record for sale called Opus Medico Musica, and you can get that on iTunes. And I believe it's still available on Amazon, and you can get it from my site as well. Um, and I have, a, I have a site on Reverb Nation that you can download, I think, two or three records for free and then buy that one if you want. So you can check that out. Um, I have a blog at world-mysteries.com. It's, I think, maybe eight or nine blogs up there that you can read for absolutely free. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out. And then I also host a podcast that I just started called uh, Marty Leeds Mathematical Radio Hour. And you can get that at the Sync Book. Uh, Sync is S-Y-N-C book.com forward slash Marty Leeds. And I'm only on like fifth or sixth episode or something like that but i've had a ball doing it so Mm -hmm. it's i just get to talk to a lot of these just fantastic researchers and just really interesting minds so and i'm probably going to do that for maybe like a year or something like that um so yeah look forward to that and and like i said most of this stuff is absolutely free you don't i mean if you you can investigate this seriously for like the rest of your life without ever giving me a cent of your money (laughs) you know so i i I would appreciate if you would throw some money my way but you know I, i i like to put this information out free because i think um it's it's I think it's that important. So it's a noble cause, man. Uh, this has been excellent. I, you know, I, I'd love to do it again. And uh, keep up the great work, man. Fascinating stuff. And take care of yourself out there. All right, thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on. You got it. There we.